morning, good afternoon, good evening, or even good night, depending on whatever time of day or night you are watching this show. But welcome in, nonetheless, to another episode of In Touch with Indiana Sports, powered by HoosierIllustrated.com. Welcome aboard. Happy Wednesday, or again, whatever day you're deciding to consume this content on. We're happy to have you along. As always, John Alden with you here on a Wednesday. I noticed this a couple of days ago. I never introduce myself with my name for those who may be unfamiliar with who I am. I know if you're on YouTube, you can see my name on the screen, but I feel like it may be a little unprofessional of me to not introduce myself at the beginning of each episode. So with that being said, once again, my name is John Alden. You can follow me on Twitter at Alden on the Air. If you mess around with the Twitters or the X's, whatever they call it, I know it's officially known as X now, but it was Twitter for so long that it's impossible to not call it Twitter anymore. Um, so whatever Elon Musk wants to do, rename it X. I mean, that's fine. I know some people have, have adjusted to calling it X better than me, of course. Um, but we're here and it's Wednesday and it's hot once again, but we're not going to complain about the heat. We're on the downswing, even though this is one of the hottest weeks we've had this year. The tease that we got last week with the fall-like weather was all the sign that I needed that college football was on its way, and now is officially here, and we're just a, we're less than a month away from it officially being fall. So these hot temperatures, they're on their way out. We'll withstand them for however long we need to, but I do believe we're on the downswing. Uh, Mother Nature is getting her revenge right now, but... It won't last much longer, I don't think. I think we're going to get some more temperate stuff here in the very near future. But a lot of good stuff to get into today. Had a great conversation with our man Mitchell Page, previewing this upcoming week one matchup with Florida International. Didn't talk a whole lot of X's and O's. That doesn't always make for good radio. I say that in quotations because I know this technically isn't a radio show, even though I kind of format it in a similar way if that makes sense. Um, I guess just good content overall is what I'm referring to. But Mitchell and I had a very good conversation about the upcoming football season, expectations. I mean, things we've been talking about really the last month or so, for however long it may be. Um, but we're both excited, and I'm looking forward to sharing that conversation with you here in a little bit. Uh, also going to get into some basketball news. Um on the, you know, outside of Indiana, or excuse me, with Indiana, you got the announcement of the charity exhibition. We'll get into that here in just a moment. UConn reportedly may be heading to the Big 12, which is some news. And we'll get into details with that a little bit later. Andy Katz names his top 10 fan bases in the country. And lists like this are obviously just clickbait, but I'll dive into that here in a little bit. And then we'll also dive into a little bit of some of the games that will be happening on Thursday tomorrow as week one for college football officially gets underway on Thursday. So where do we start? I think since we're we're going to be pretty football heavy with Mitchell Page, I think we'll go ahead and jump into a little bit of basketball since the big news of the day or of the week, I should say, at least for, other than Jalen Harrelson's upcoming visit, is the announcement that Indiana will play in a charity exhibition game this year. And I know we talked about that last week when Purdue announced that they'll be playing in their second ever charity exhibition. They'll be playing against Creighton in Omaha. And I believe that, yeah, they played Arkansas last year, and Indiana didn't play in one of those, unless I'm mistaken. Uh but Indiana will be facing Tennessee down in Knoxville on October 27th, I believe. Let me pull that up real quick, make sure I got that date correct. We'll be playing in Thompson Bowling Arena on, on Sunday, October 27th. And the charity that this game will benefit is the John McLendon Foundation, which offers scholarships to minority students pursuing a postgraduate degree in athletics administration. So... Uh, good stuff there, and this will be a great opportunity for fans and for the team in general to be able to kind of cut their chops, both teams really, against high-caliber opponents and 
I tell you what, here's another thing. It's going to give fans an opportunity to overreact early because playing in, in an early game like this, you never know what you're going to get out of your players. And when you're playing really good competition, it can be very easy to overreact one way or another. Indiana may get demolished by Tennessee, or they may demolish Tennessee. And you may not have either one of those results, but both of those results in particular would be cause for overreaction in both ways. You may have Indiana fans saying, oh my gosh, this team is the worst team in the world. What the hell is Mike Woodson thinking? Or you may get the other side of the coin where Indiana fans all of a sudden think they're the best team of the country because they go into Knoxville and beat them by 20. And again, there's no telling how that game's going to play out or you know how rotations will look. Because again, it is an exhibition. Ultimately, you want players to come out of this healthy and ready for the, the season to actually begin a couple of weeks later. But nonetheless, this is a great opportunity for fans to be able to see their team out on the floor for the first time against formidable competition. And Tennessee, I believe, is a consensus top 10, top 15 team heading into the season. So this will, without a doubt, be a really good challenge for Mike Woodson and his Indiana Hoosiers basketball team as they prepare for the 2024-25 season. And another nice thing, I guess, that comes with, like, you know, when you think of comparisons and how, you know, the regular season is affected, the Louisville team that Indiana will face in the Bahamas will also face Tennessee in the regular season. I believe it's their second game, and they'll be playing them at the KFC Yum Center in Louisville. So now you have a three common opponents, or two common opponents, however you want to phrase it, um, for Indiana as they prepare for their upcoming season. But it will be nice to see some of these guys on the floor, especially I know fans are going to be very excited to see all of the new faces and how they mesh together with the returning guys, obviously Umar Ballo, uh, Luke Goody, Miles, almost said Miles Kanan, but it's Kanan Carlisle and Miles Rice. Um, and then a few other names, of course, the freshman Bryson Tucker. It's probably one of those games, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't know exactly how they will approach it, but I feel like it's going to be one of those games where you see just about every combination on the floor because, of course, it is an exhibition. Yes, you want to win. You want to look good. But this is ultimately for charity and for to, to give fans an opportunity to see. But as fans typically do, they overreact. But that's that's part of being a fan sometimes. Whether it's justified or not, you're going to have overreaction to this one way or another. Uh, I mean, unless you have a close game. Because honestly, when you have two teams like Indiana and Tennessee, who are probably fairly close when it comes to talent level this year, I mean, a game that is within five points or less, I don't know that there would actually be like a betting spread on, a, on an exhibition like this. But if there were, I would expect it to be somewhere, maybe maybe Tennessee's favored by three and a half, four and a half points, something along those lines. That wouldn't surprise me, um, especially because it will be played at Tennessee. And I think you, sh if you're an Indiana fan, without ever seeing this team play, you should be happy with, a result that at the very least is a competitive game because again this the result doesn't necessarily mean anything and it doesn't at all for your record or for march any of that stuff this is just to get a look at your team at what may be to come in the season ahead so excited for that again that'll be on october 27th in knoxville and the tip time and tv network will be announced at a later date i do believe that means it will be on TV. Um, again, in the middle of football season, especially on Sunday, you'll be competing with the NFL. So, I mean, but obviously not every television network has uh, NFL football going on. So it, it may likely be on something like the SEC network since it is at Tennessee. That'd be my guess. So we'll have to wait and see that. And if you are interested in buying tickets, heading down to Knoxville for this exhibition, you can buy buy the tickets on, beginning on September 16th via allvols.com. That's A-L-L-V-O-L-S.com. And obviously, I'm not sponsored by them, and it probably goes without saying, but just for those of you who may be interested in going down to see the Hoosiers play on the road in an exhibition matchup, that is how you can do so. So I was talking about fan bases and how they can get a little erratic sometimes. Well. 
Andy Katz, jack of all trades. He was worked for really all the networks, it seems like. Used to be a VSPN. Now he's with the Big Ten Network, the NCAA. He works for really everybody, it seems like. Yesterday, he decided to post a tweet, a graphic, I should say, on Twitter, slash X. And he it has a very simple caption that says it's his top 10 fan bases in the country. And he's talking about college basketball. Um, I was going to say, how do we know it's college basketball, by the way? But it's, it was posted by the March Madness page. So, yes, it is for college basketball. And here's just for those who hasn't seen, here's the list from 1 to 10. Kentucky, UConn, Kansas, Duke, Purdue, Illinois, North Carolina, Indiana, Arkansas, and Iowa State. I don't want to say there's a lot to unpack because it is fairly simple, but there's a few things that jump out at me. The two two Big Ten teams ahead of Indiana baffles me, Illinois and Purdue. And I know Purdue has a very passionate fan base, and they have a very good tradition in basketball, but you can't act like the fan base for the flagship program, Indiana University, is less passionate than the very niche, much smaller fan base of the Purdue Boilermakers. And I know I'm not trying to say that their fan base is tiny because I know that there are Purdue fans in the state of Indiana, specifically mostly north of the Indianapolis line. But it just surprised. I, I mean, like I said earlier, when I kind of prefaced this this tweet, this is clickbait. This is this is engagement farming, as they say. They want people to respond to this and be angry and say, why did you not put my fan base higher? And a couple other weird things on here. No Louisville. You have you see Iowa State over Louisville, Arkansas over Louisville. I mean, UConn higher than Kansas and Duke. I mean, I, I know here's the thing. I'm not based. This isn't based off of program success, obviously. This is fan bases. And here's the other thing. I think this would be a more accurate list if this were listing the top 10 home court advantages. Because I do believe there was like a follow-up tweet or a post of some sort that was referring to how the fans help get these teams over the hump in home games. So if you phrase this as the top 10 home court advantages in college basketball, I do think it is a little more justified. Maybe that's what this was meant to be and it was just worded really weird because. I mean, over the last several years, Purdue probably has had a better home court advantage than Indiana, and that would make more sense of this. Illinois, maybe the same thing for them. Uh, Kentucky being number one, when you put it in that type of a category, I don't know that I would make them the highest home court advantage. I think Kansas should probably get bumped up to number one, for being honest there, maybe Duke up to number two. And that also, to me, justifies Iowa State being in this list because the Hilton Magic Man at Hilton Coliseum, I don't even know that's what it's called anymore, I believe it is, Iowa State may be outside of Kansas. I guess that's kind of the way it looks on here if you look at it. The toughest place to play in the Big 12. I wouldn't want to play there if I was Indiana because that place can get rowdy. So just wanted to throw that out there. It definitely. Let me see if I can find some funny comments of people, people being – angry about this so somebody says somebody named gridiron gauge says this list could double as a list of most toxic fan bases that's uh probably very true someone named north click hick says duke is global not even a debate number one i kind of see, see duke fans duke basketball fans are a lot like alabama football fans many of them have never lived North Carolina, never went to Duke, but they know that they've always been near the top of college basketball. So at one point or another in their life, they decided they were going to be a Duke Blue Devils basketball fan. And to that, I guess maybe that makes sense, but true Duke fans, those who have been around it forever and maybe grew up near it or maybe even went to the school, there's not nearly as many of those because Duke is a tiny school. So there you go. We'll uh we'll we'll leave that at that. I just wanted to share that this morning as we 
get, I say this morning. I got to get better. Not that it matters, but I know that I record this typically in the mornings and not everybody listens. I mean, usually this releases in the afternoons, but depending on when you listen to it, it may not be the morning. Could be the evening, the afternoon, may even be overnight, depending on where you come from. So I guess with that being said, let's go ahead and transition and bring in our man, Mitchell Page, to talk a little more Indiana football as we get this much closer to kickoff at Memorial Stadium at 3.30 this Saturday. Without further ado, here is Mitchell Page. Joining me now is the former walk-on turned scholarship superstar. I haven't used that in a while. The man, the myth, the legend, Mitchell Page. Welcome once again to In Touch with Indiana Sports, my friend. What's up, man? You haven't used that in a while. That's That used to be my go-to for anything Indiana football related whenever you and I would have a conversation. Yeah, a little stroke of the ego. I can appreciate it. We can. We like to do that. We like to stroke the ego. The ego. Almost said the eagle. Stroking the eagle. I don't know if that's. If this were an out of touch episode, that would. If that would become the title immediately, because anytime I say things that aren't true sayings, those things happen often, and they tend to become titles of shows. They, I was gonna say that. That's actually a pretty good title. Stroking yeah. the eagle. Stroking the eagle. Uh, Indiana won't be playing the Eagles this week. They'll be playing the Panthers of Florida International. Are you excited? This probably goes without saying, but. Your excitement level for Indiana football last year compared to this year, where are you at right now? Um, I I think it's a lot more, but it's it's more nervous than anything. Cautious optimism, huh? Yeah. Um, but for football in general, I w- I've actually talked about this a couple of times with a couple of different people. Uh, I am more excited for football this year than I have been probably since my last year playing college football. And okay. I don't know if the you spend enough time away from it and you start to remember how much you love it. Um, but I, I'm really, really excited. I'm a fan of two teams, the Hoosiers and the Miami Hurricanes, and both are looking uh, looking at this season with some hope. So I've been all over watching previews of the Hoosiers and just trying to to gather as much intel on all the new faces as you can. And we'll see what happens on Saturday. Uh, and it's a lot better, the combination Indiana and Miami, than the stereotypical combination that is Indiana and Notre Dame, more specifically Indiana basketball, Notre Dame football fans. I've always said that just seems like a cop out for the most successful teams in your state. Yeah. And being a Miami Hurricanes fan growing up, uh, if you know anything about their rivalry, their history, Catholics versus convicts, I hate Notre Dame. So anything bad that happens to them, I'm all for it. <laughs> Uh, them not being able to get higher than fifth in college football playoff because they're too scared to be in a conference. I love it. I wish they were not even allowed in the college football playoff. I'm about the biggest Notre Dame hater, maybe outside of ND hater one. That there we go. Shout out ND hater out. one. <laughs> so obviously we're not going to talk X's nose or anything like that. It doesn't really yeah. tend to be much entertaining. This isn't radio, of course, but you know any sort of podcast show, whatever it may be. We like to talk more of the emotional aspect of getting into the year and what a game one means with a new era like this, it feels like there's a lot more weight that will be carried with this first game than in previous first year games for, you know, new head coaches in Indiana, for whatever reason, you have the new big 10, the new college football playoff, not that Indiana will necessarily be in that playoff, but it's just something new to college football. It just feels like the magnitude of putting together a decent result, you don't have to go out and slaughter FIU, but at least looking formidable and like you belong, it seems like it's more important to do it in this type of game than in previous seasons. I actually disagree. I think okay. for all the talk, and there has been a lot of it, you better come out and steamroll FIU. FIU is not a good football team. They haven't been for a long time. You bring in these portal additions. You talk the talk. Now it's time to walk the walk. I think that's the difference. Uh, there hasn't been an Indiana coach that's come in and been borderline as borderline arrogant as Kurt Signetti, and it's good. <laughs> I like it. I think you have to be in a program like Indiana, but it's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way if you don't come out with some fire, uh, some intensity, really aggressive on offense, flying around on defense. Maybe the first quarter you get a little leeway, but after that, for all the talk, you better come out with some with some fire uh, because you kind of brought it on yourself. 
Well, yeah, and that's the thing. Maybe I didn't explain it good enough. We're on the same page. I thought yeah. I, maybe I was dancing around the point too much, but that's kind of what I was trying to say as I was leading. Yeah, you're absolutely, your absolutely correct that this this year there is a lot heavier um, weight that's being carried by the program because the head coach brought it with him. And I think he's he he thinks not even thinks. He has thrived on it. He's been a head coach for 13 seasons. He's never had a losing record. And I think that's kind of the early benchmark for Indiana football heading into this inaugural season for Kurt Signetti. And a lot of people think six and six is kind of the, the minimum. I'm kind of there as well. But at the same time, I do feel like there's enough returning talent. And if the transfer portal talent pans out to what it could be, and you know, a couple of 50 50 games go your way. You could easily see this team going seven and five, eight and four, and we'll get crazy. At least I'll get crazy after the eight wins once we see a few games. But whenever we did our preview podcast on HoosierIllustrated.com, I predicted Indiana to go eight and four, which some people may think that is getting a little too ahead. But I do think there is a lot of favorability with what's ahead that if things do pan out in the way that they could positively, of course. I don't think that's too crazy to say. And we've we've seen Indiana teams get eight and four records before as recently as 2019. Yeah. If anybody, uh, if you're looking for a better situation to do it in, it's with eight home games and you get away from a, a Big Ten that some years are going to punch you right in the mouth. Uh, with the new additions, you're going to have years where you get Oregon, Penn State, Michigan, and Ohio State all in the same season. You get Washington, that's always good. And, yeah, they get them this year, but who knows where that program's at. They may need a year to rebound a little bit. You get UCLA that's down. There'll be years when they're good. You're, you're just going to get a lot more fluctuation in the schedule and eight home games and some teams that are pretty beatable. You've got to make some hay right now, especially when the world of recruiting – uh, if you can't, you brought in some really good players, and if you can't make it happen and show some vision to new players and the current players on the roster, as is the na nature of college football, Indiana can sometimes be a stepping stone program. As you see, some guys that transferred to you know Miami and other places and are starting and doing some awesome things, competing for national championships. Look at the guys that went to Michigan last year. Uh, you have to to do something on the field that gives the people in the building and people around the program inside and outside the program, uh, reason to believe and reason to want to be in Bloomington. It's a, it's a big year. You're going to have all the TV on you. You're going to have all the media coverage that you could want. And you've got not a, a golden walkway to get to where you want to be, but you've got about as easy a schedule as you're going to get with eight home games. It, it's time to, and I know it's only the first year, but sometimes you get tested early and the gods look down on you favorably. It feels like that is this year with Indiana. Yeah, and we'll see. And I hate – easy is a term I try to refrain from using. I mean, say whatever the hell you want, of course. I mean, we all should say whatever the hell we want, but favorable, however you want to look at it. The ultimate – turnover or turnaround game whatever you want to call it I guess pivot game where the season may head is UCLA in week three as long as you don't lay an egg in one of these openers with Western Illinois and um, FIU to kick things off take care of business there and then you can really get things rolling if you go down to Los Angeles and beat the Bruins in week three so but one thing you mentioned you mentioned recruiting and the importance of that have you been following all this Julian Lewis stuff the five, the five-star quarterback who's been kind of flirting with Indiana a lot of people think he's going to decommit from USC I'm not asking you to predict whether or not he ends up with Indiana but if he were to end up with the Hoosiers what do you think that would do as somebody who is a former player yourself see I'm always skeptical um now, we didn't have any real, like, true five-star players, but I played with a lot of high four-star guys that didn't really pan out. So I'm always somebody, especially with high school kids, you better show me you can do it at the college level. But with that being said, I love what the kid's doing. Uh, make a name for yourself. Give Indiana fans some hope. I'm hoping he comes. I mean, it's really cool <laughs> that he's even considering it and – Having a, a coach on staff that can have that big of an impact on that level of a player uh, and 
Is it Sunseri? I think Tino Sunseri, yeah, yep. QB coach. Just having having that much respect in a high schooler's mind, it goes a long way in being able to tell the story of, hey, this kid was thinking about coming to Indiana, and we lost to Rutgers by seventy last year. So <laughs> it's not uh, he's not coming because of the tradition. He's coming because of what he believes or he at least considered it because of what he believes is happening in the building right now. It tells a really good story. It, it's something that you can relate to kids that you're recruiting now, whether he comes or he doesn't. I obviously hope he does. This is a, a little sidebar. I always love <laughs> when all of this was first happening and he took his visit to Indiana, it was always five-star QB, five-star QB, five-star. And since he's been to Indiana and been flirting with it, it's not every news outlet, but some of them are now talking about four-star QB, Julian Lewis. So it's interesting how that happens now that he's not only considering USC and Tennessee and Ohio State. Now that Indiana's kind of locked their uh, – or punched a ticket and to the show, see if they can make it happen, now all of a sudden we're hesitating to call him a five-star Because here's what will happen. Yeah, if, if one of the big guys like Auburn or USC, if USC is able to retain him, of course, if they get him, he'll still be known as a five-star because that's how they'll frame it. But 100%. those same people who cover those teams, if he goes to a Colorado or an Indiana, one of the lower level schools, Coach Prime won't say Colorado's lower level, but historically they are. They'll they'll frame it as a four star, and that they'll say that's why he ultimately ended up not going to their school instead. So that's yeah, just you know he wasn't good enough, and yeah. <laughs> he's all automatically, and that's a hard part for him because he's going to get this hopefully chip if he ever. If he does end up coming to Indiana, and I, I'd give it a 5%, 10% chance. Uh, it, when you have a chance to go to USC with the money that they have in NIL and the exposure that you get, it's hard to pass up something like that. But let's say he comes to Indiana, and I know Indiana's got deep pockets, way deeper than uh, people would expect. This is a little inside information. I think a lot of people know it more now than they used to, but – Indiana football has a, a little treasure trove of NIL dollars that they've been able to to ship out to some really quality players. Getting them to come is a little different thing just because we've been so terrible and we've got an unproven coach that money talks most of the time, but it's a lot easier when you got a program with tradition. But having, I mean, all of that is to say, like Indiana can compete in the NIL world, but the exposure that you get with the USC on the side of your helmet. And yeah, it's the big 10. We're one of the super conferences, but we're still trying to work our way through that. Uh, it just is Indiana's in such an interesting spot with him and with future commits. That's why I think that this year is so important. And the first couple games are so important. It almost feels like, like we keep mentioning if they can get off to that perfect start and really get the the gears rolling i'm sure somebody like julian lewis and even some other guys who may be mm -hmm. on the higher end of things they're probably waiting no matter what the nil money looks like because ultimately these guys do want to win and be at a place that's going to provide the exposure for the nfl indiana still has to prove that they can do that under this regime but and that that could be the golden gift for signetti because if you take advantage of what's in front of you as we've been saying all off season long I mean, the treasure trove is there. You mentioned the treasure trove of NIL, but the treasure yeah. trove of players as well. And that includes the transfer portal. There will be higher level guys that are experienced players that will want to be a part of this too if you can put together a good first season. Yeah, and I think it was Nick Saban talking about this on game day. The transfer portal, almost unintended consequences of the transfer portal has made the best players – a little bit worse, but has also brought the players that weren't playing as much up to the middle. So you're going to see a ton of parity in college football. That's what gives Indiana such a big chance at maybe a guy that's at Clemson or Alabama that's a backup that says, hey, man, I, I want to play every snap. Let me go to somewhere like Indiana where now they've got this five-star quarterback and you can start adding wins on top of each other with a good start to the season, with some kind of eight and four I, I believe nine and three is out there. I really do. It's it's a, it's favorable, man. It really is. You just have to take care of business. And Indiana's tradition is getting a game that they should win and stub your toe. There are plenty of stub your toe games on this um, schedule this year. A team like Nebraska that you know everybody's real high on. They're kind of similar to Indiana. 
to me where they could Except go. Except their to, expectations, big picture, are typically higher. That's really the biggest for difference. Sure, I just mean like. in this season where they've made yeah. a lot of portal acquisitions. They've got their new quarterback that's a true freshman. I've seen true freshman quarterbacks. The game happens a little bit quicker. If he's able to handle it, great. But there'll be some bullets flying. And by week seven, who knows where that guy uh, could be mentally. That's another one that you get a chance to win. There's just a lot of really winnable games and some of the tougher games that maybe only have 35, 40% chance to win are at home. And if you take care of business leading up to those games, like who wouldn't from Indiana want to go see Washington play Indiana late in the season when Indiana's shown some fight. Now that stadium becomes a true home field advantage. There's so many things that can happen with a great start to the season. You get out 3-0, and 4-0. and Fans will back the program. You just got to prove it especially because he's been talking so much. <laughs> I want to get to a question that our friend Justin Beard posed on the YouTubes. Uh, he asked us the other day on the show, but I thought maybe getting your perspective would be pretty smart as well. He says, will these mid-major players be ready to step up to play competitive Big Ten football? I think Signetti is doing his best to make that happen. Obviously, only only they know and only the staff knows, but as somebody who who went through a football program, obviously Indiana specifically under a different regime, and you were a walk-on, you had to fight your way for the playing time and eventually get that scholarship. That, that's kind of why I want your perspective on, on that question. Yeah, so it's a good question. And what I'll tell you is the guys that are at the mid-major, the teams at the very top from maybe not Alabama, exclude Alabama, but some – good power four teams down to even the middle of tier FCS teams, their starters are all pretty comparable outside of a couple freaks. There's a bunch of really good players all over the place. The reason that the big teams are the big teams is because the twos and threes are way better than the twos and threes on the other teams. When you start having to cycle through your roster as the game wears on, that's where you start to see uh, separation. So, a high, high level guy like Elijah Sherratt that comes from, I don't even know where he came from, but some James Madison guy. James Madison. Okay. Um, they prove they can do it at a really high level, right? And they beat a lot of really good teams. I don't have any doubt moving into the Big Ten. All they're doing is changing their conference. It would be a lot harder if that guy was a second string and trying to find a spot on Indiana, but the really, really good players at programs like that could play pretty much anywhere. Maybe not at every single position. I, I Let me, I guess, walk back what I'm saying. But I don't think all 22 guys on a roster like that could play everywhere. But the top 10 probably could. And I think Indiana got a lot of guys that have proven they can perform. I don't doubt for a second they'll be ready to step in and, and make some plays. And especially with the chip on their shoulder, they're under-recruited guys. We saw what... Uh, I saw that personally, what happens when something like that. <laughs> Who are you most looking forward to? And I don't know how much you've had a chance to look at any of the incoming players or even guys who are returning. Who do you think will kind of be sort of an X factor for success with Indiana this year, whether it be offense or defense? Yeah, you have to start with the quarterback. They've been so bad. Uh, not bad, just – very inconsistent. Yeah, that's they show sparks and then throw the ball to the other team or they make a play that kills drives. Uh, I think the quarterback and then offensive line running back combo. Wide receivers, they got a ton of skill, and yeah, they'll open the run game up a ton if we can throw the ball down the field. But being able to gain the Jordan Howard yards, the four or five yards when maybe a play is busted up and you just need to get some uh, – that's going to be really important for settling in a new quarterback, establishing some toughness up front, especially in those first couple games. Uh, but I think the guy that I'm most excited to watch is the middle linebacker. I don't know what the heck his name is. Aiden Fisher. Yes. Another JMU transfer. Yes. You, you watch him in interviews and he carries himself like the leader of a team. And for whatever reason, Indiana, since Mike McFadden has kind of been missing that you don't really have an identity. He seems to, to play with a downhill force that similar to the run game establishes, Hey, we're going to be tough. We're going to be in your face and we're going to fly around and make some plays. If you can control the front seven on defense and 
run the ball on offense. Everybody loves to throw it around, score a million points. But the games are still won up front. And all the good teams in the SEC, yeah, they've got skill all over the place. Those games are won along the defensive and offensive line with the running backs and the linebackers. So you need somebody like Aiden Fisher that can get guys in the right place. It's a new defense for most of these guys. Get them in the right place. Make sure we're set because you come out and hold FIU to three, seven, ten points, smoke them. It just – you start to see things kind of snowball and everything gets easier when you've proven to yourself that you can do it. And it's a lot easier on defense to get clicking right away than it is on offense, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. And I think this goes into kind of, I guess, what I want to my, – my expectation for what I want and hope the program could be under Signetti. What I want to be able to see – and I know it may be tough to ask in game one, maybe in quarter one of game one. I don't think it should be tough to ask considering all the talk that's been going on. Mm -hmm. But I want this team to know and put on the field, really just execute that they are the better team from start to finish. Not even just against FIU, but against every opponent that is automatically going to be inferior to them. I want to be able to see this team after the first two weeks go into UCLA knowing that what they've already done in those first two weeks has already, even though they haven't played anybody, give them that type of confidence or really just assure them, I guess, because if they're playing that well, they may already have the confidence, but assure them that they have all of the right in the world to take, I hate to say take care of business against UCLA because Indiana could throttle both of these opponents and maybe still be underdogs on the road against the Bruins. I'm sure reason. they will be underdogs. I'm 100% positive they will. And obviously part of that depends on what UCLA does in their first sure. action. They only play, they play Hawaii in week one, and then they have their first bye right after that. They'll only play one game before yeah. they play. Indiana, Indiana. will 100% be an underdog, but I'm going to, so I feel like I've kind of dogged Signetti for a little bit of arrogance. Now we're going to flip the coin okay? because it's exactly right what you're saying. For a long time, Indiana has felt like we're not as good as them, but we can execute better than them. We can throw some blitzes at them. We can cause some havoc, and we may get lucky they might throw it to us. Signetti brings an attitude that's exactly what you're saying, where I am better than you. I don't need any gimmicks. I can run what I want to run. I dictate the show. This is my game. You have to play my game, and we're going to beat you at it. And – when you're able to do that and actually dictate how a game goes, that starts to build in a different kind of confidence that I think Tom Allen's team captured for like six games where they it was believed, a very short blip because it wasn't stopped until the bowl game when they yes. lost to Ole Miss. That's when that came to an end. Yes. Yeah. And I don't think it's necessarily the worst thing that you look at an Ole Miss roster and think, Indiana might not be quite as good as Ole Miss. That's a true SEC team with SEC athletes running all over the field. I don't think we are quite, quite ready to, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe on the athlete battle with a team like Ole Miss. Uh, but you start putting some things on the field that are solid right now. You start looking year three, year three, the show-me year. You start getting some – wins stacked on top of each other. I don't think it's crazy to say in two or three years we can't feel a team that's toe-to-toe -to -toe athletically with maybe not Ole Miss in the place that they're at, top 10, top five team in the country, but SEC teams, the bigger boys of the Big Ten, maybe not Ohio State, but someone like an Iowa or Penn State in most years. I don't think that's unrealistic, and – that goes back to a couple things. If Signetti can just continue to win at his clip, I'll shut the heck up about him being arrogant. I'll tell you that. If he just shows <laughs> it, I'll be the first one to admit that maybe I was a little harsh. Uh, bunch of money back in the Hoosiers in one of the biggest conferences the world's ever seen. <laughs> um, and I'll say this football. too. One thing that slightly worries me about Signetti, there's, there's, there's a worry and there's also not a worry. And part of it's because of his age, but, one thing that worries me, if he has, I hate to say too much success, 
let's just say he wins nine plus games. And first of all, when I say that, I'm not predicting that. I always preface that whenever yeah. I theorize right here. But if he were to win that many games in year one, it does worry me that knowing that he has little time left, more I mean, I would say 10 years, he's 63 years old. If he play, if he coaches 10 more years, he'll be 73. That's fairly old. And he may go longer than that. That's just kind of a, a template, I guess, to to potentially assume how much or project, I should say, how much longer he may coach. If he wants to make one more jump to a bigger program and he has immediate high level success with Indiana, I do worry that he may only stick around for one year. So part of me is like, and again, it's all just speculation. Maybe there's not even a reason to think about this at all especially when we haven't even seen him field a team just yet. We're a few days away from that still. But if he wins seven, eight games, eight's probably the max where you where you can probably be comfortable with him saying maybe he'll still stick around. I don't know. Maybe there isn't a true level. Um, but I feel yeah. like if he can get through that first year and not have the overwhelming success – I, don't know, I feel weird even just going down this path because I don't yeah. like to root for mediocrity. You know I'm what I mean? I disagree 100%. Um, because yeah, go ahead and steal it, me away yeah, from this idiotic point that I'm trying to The reason that I disagree is make. the same thing about recruiting. If you go out this year and show that there's something happening here, it's a wave of momentum for recruiting. But it's also a wave of momentum for Kurt Signetti, which I think I've referenced this little bit that I'm about to say a couple times. One of my favorite things about Kurt Signetti is this doesn't feel like he loves Indiana. It feels more like he likes Kurt Signetti. And yeah. he wants his name to be associated with the turnaround of the team with the most losses in Division One history. I, I think that there's a serious part of him that wants to show everybody that he can do whatever he wants, wherever he wants. It doesn't matter where he's at. Uh, so I think that those two things together have some momentum where now you can start to see some positive things happen in the program. You see an upward trajectory. Maybe he gets to nine wins, but lose a close one to Ohio state or something like that. And you get just a little bit of taste of what it could really be because it can with the amount of money that's involved in Indian athletics, the amount of money that runs through the Big Ten, Bloomington's a pretty sweet place to go to school. And yeah, we may not have South Florida in our backyard to go recruit, but we brought kids from up there. Purdue doesn't have a hard time getting them to come to Purdue, and West Lafayette stinks out loud. <laughs> so imagine Indiana's able to get some some momentum. There's no telling where this could go, uh, which is why I think that I, I really don't see him jumping to somewhere like Alabama, like Kalen DeBoer. I don't mean Alabama, yeah. yeah which I'll, which I'll, goes I'll, back, again, this is the last thing I'll say about it. There's also <laughs> no way to ever know, because Kalen Boer was just in the national championship game at Washington yeah. and left within a day. Like, <laughs> who knows where these guys are going. All this Signetti, conversation may be irrelevant, too. Yeah, we may course. lose every game. We may be and that's, it, that's the last thing. Here's the last thing I want to mention, and then we'll wrap this thing up. And that's I feel like if this doesn't pan out, if he comes out and barely beats FIU, you know, gets a you know a normal win against Western Illinois, wins by three or four touchdowns, and then has your typical Indiana season, goes three and nine, four and eight. I don't think I'll ever be able to be hopeful about an Indiana coach ever again. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? I, Maybe I'm wrong about that, but it feels like we've never had such a I hate saying we I'm not a part of the program obviously I'm talking speaking as a fan but it feels like it's never been such a quick onboarding of fans with this new regime and than any other head coach that Indiana's ever had yeah he's fired us up and I, I think it's almost got to the point where I am now where it's we've talked for so long about Forget Ohio State, forget Michigan, Purdue sucks too. Uh, I love it. I agree. Let's go for everything. We have everything that we need is in the program, in the building right now. We just got to go prove it. And every time Indiana has to go prove it, things get a little hairy. So, yeah, I'm, I cannot wait for 3.30 on Saturday. I did think I was going. I don't think I can go because it's going to be so hot. And with the little baby, hot. with the little baby, it was going to be tough to – to make the trip and stay outside with her she'd be hating that but 
Uh, <laughs> I can't wait. I know it's going to be fun season regardless. Whether we're miserable, we'll be miserable together. If we're excited, what a ride it'll be. Mitchell Page, the former Indiana Hoosier wide receiver, appreciate you joining me as always. Yes, sir. Happy to be here. A big thanks, as always, to Mitchell Page for taking some time to talk some Indiana football. I know he is extremely excited for the season ahead and both nervous at the same time because I'm I'm in that same boat because we've been let down time and time again as Indiana football fans and him even more so as an alum of the program. And we're just ready for some change, as I'm sure you are as well. And hopefully it's for the better. We'll get our first taste of it uh, just a few days from now on Saturday. And uh, I mean, we're all very excited. We're cautiously optimistic, but I'd say there's a lot more substance that goes along with it than in previous seasons. So at this point, we just wait and see. We'll continue to preview it throughout the rest of the week. Alec Lasley will be with us on Friday to, I guess, kind of do some final thoughts as we get ready for Saturday. And then after that, I guess let me go ahead and I can I'll be able to confirm this more so on Friday as well. But in regard to post game shows, I'm not 100 percent sure how we are going to handle that yet, because I was chatting with whenever Mitchell and I recorded that segment last night. We did talk a little afterwards about what his interest would be and availability would be like to do some post game shows. And right now it's looking more so like we may we may stray away from doing live editions of the post game shows in favor of something more along the lines of a Monday reaction. And it may just kind of lead us off on Mondays here at in touch with Indiana sports. Um, so, but I'll be, I'll be able to say or not, excuse me, a little bit of word vomit. I'll be able to share more definite information on what that will look like on Friday. I was really hoping to do live post game shows and we may still do that. We might, um, but I do, I, I would love for Mitchell to be a part of it in every way possible and because it just adds so much more, I guess I'd say raw emotion. I don't mean that to sound dramatic, but that's really just what it is. And uh, I'd love to be able to interact with you guys live as well. So I'll give you some more information on Friday. We're having a meeting the folks at Hoosier Illustrated, I mean, when I say that, we're having a meeting to, uh, later this week, I believe tomorrow, to discuss some big picture stuff as we move into the season. So I'll be able to share anything related to post game show stuff, hopefully on Friday. So hopefully I have some good things for you then. Um, with that being said, let's go ahead and move on to the I want to look at some of these Thursday matchups because when we come when I reconvene with you on Friday, we'll already have our first set of week one games complete when it comes to, uh, you know, the games that are taking place on Thursday. Um, and there's a lot of games, not necessarily a ton of amazing matchups. I do think I'm going to save my betting picks for the weekend games. And again, I'm I'm so I'm not angry, obviously, I'm not physically angry, but I cannot believe that the picks that I made on this show on Friday came to fruition over the weekend and I didn't make any actual financial. I didn't put a financial stake in them, which makes me think that there's no way I can do that again. But either way, some of the matchups to look forward to, I'll try to highlight all the Big Ten teams that are playing as well as some of the other more interesting matchups. Getting us rolling on Thursday, we've got Howard at Rutgers at 6 p.m. on the Big Ten Network. No spread currently for that. As it, and as most games, I mean, you can find spreads with FCS teams, but most times when an FBS team is playing an FCS team, I've mentioned this before, you don't always see a spread on uh, all of the websites. And I'm looking at ESPN right now specifically. So Rutgers should likely take care of business in that game, though. And Rutgers might be a sneaky good Big Ten team this year. And it's probably a good thing that Indiana kind of avoids the Scarlet Knights because they are supposedly primed to have kind of a breakout year. And uh, Greg Schiano has kind of had the Scarlet Knights on an uptick ever since he returned to Piscataway. So keep an eye out for Rutgers 
this season in the Big Ten. What else do we got going on here on with some Thursday action? I mean, not a lot of good games of interest. I mean, again, I know it's week one and they they can really just put anything on any network they want. I'll just share some of the games that will be you know, the ones that aren't necessarily good matchups, but some of the games that will be on television where you can find them. You can find Western Carolina at number 24 NC State on the ACC network at 7 p.m. You can find Arkansas Pine Bluff at Arkansas on ESPNU at 7.30. Again, these are all Thursday games, by the way. And this will be Bobby Petrino's return to Arkansas. Now, he's not the head coach, but he was brought in as the offensive coordinator for a head coach that is kind of been on the downswing, kind of had his seats a little warm, if I say so. And a lot of people, including myself, have thought that maybe this, like if things kind of go south early on for Arkansas, this could be their excuse to maybe fire. I can't even think of the head coach's name for Arkansas right now, and it's kind of pissing me off because I, I want to be able to say who it is. And I hate to have to do this on the air, but that's what we're going to do. But yeah, Arkansas's head coach, Sam Pittman. There you go. There's belief that Sam Pittman may be fired early on in the season. I say early. Early is relative. I'm just saying during the season. But early enough to where if things aren't going well, it may give Bobby Petrino a chance to kind of audition for the full-time job in the future and officially bring him back as the head coach, which would be quite the story and a very Bobby Petrino thing to do, if I say so myself. So that's one thing to watch for in that game. Murray State and number 11, Missouri, play on the SEC Network at 8 o'clock. And then the only Power 5, or I should say Power 4, the only Power 4 versus Power 4 matchup we have on Thursday involves a Big Ten team. It involves the Minnesota Golden Gophers hosting the North Carolina Tar Heels from the ACC at 8 p.m. on Fox. And North Carolina, currently a two-point favorite in this game. And... I wouldn't be surprised. I, if I were betting on that game, I'd probably take Minnesota to cover. And again, two-point spread. It's nearly a pick so it's not really saying much. Um, you almost might as well just take Minnesota money line, if I'm being honest. Uh, be a better payout. And if you're, if, you're, if you're choosing Minnesota to cover, then at the very least, you need them to lose by one. So at that point, you might as well just choose them or have them winning, if that makes sense. Um. Don't know much about these teams just yet, of course. Um, I do feel like Minnesota has a new quarterback this year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I know North Carolina no longer has Drake May, so a lot of unknowns with how both of these two teams may look on Thursday. But if that if there's a game to watch on Thursday, it's definitely North Carolina at Minnesota um, at Huntington Bank Stadium in Minneapolis. But also, competing with that game on Fox, on the other network, I should say, on ESPN, you got North Dakota State and Coach Prime's Colorado Buffaloes. Colorado favored by 10 points in that game. But hey, North Dakota State, historically, maybe the most historical FCS program that hasn't transitioned to FBS just yet, unless I'm mistaken on that too, but I do believe North Dakota State is still in the FCS. And... Uh, this will be, believe it or not, this is a big game for Coach Prime in Colorado. And because even though North Dakota State is a formidable opponent from the FCS, or at least historically has been, Colorado, if they want to take that step forward and Coach Prime kind of gain some notoriety be, for being somebody other than just an entertainer, then he needs to take care of business and probably win this game more easily than the spread indicates with 10 points. Um, and again, he doesn't have to, but, you know, if you want to get off on the right foot, it's kind of like Indiana with FIU and Kurt Signetti. Kurt Signetti doing all this talk, like he's going to really implement his system and get things rolling. You want to prove that in game one. So there are some similarities, even though there are it, there are some differences as well, of course. But that may be an interesting game to keep an eye on as well, especially if that ends up being a little too close for comfort for Colorado and the Buffaloes. Also at 8 p.m., Coastal Carolina and Jacksonville State on CBS Sports Network. 
I believe Coastal Carolina will be without Grayson McCall now. He's now with NC State, so kind of a new look for them against a Jacksonville State team who will be making their FBS debut against the Chanticleers. Or the Chanticleers. Um, I know it's one of the two. But nonetheless, moving on. And then we got two nightcap games on Thursday. Eastern Illinois taking on the Illinois Fighting Illini at 9 p.m. on the Big Ten Network. Illinois favored by 28 points. Again, this should be an easy victory for the Illini. Brett Bielema entering his third year with the Illinois football program. Will he take that step forward? Um, Again, we'll have to wait and see. And then the final game you can watch, the Sickos Committee Game of the Week. And a really not even game, maybe just the Sickos Committee Game of Thursday. Sacramento State and San Jose State on True TV. Most people know True TV as... I believe Cops used to be on that network. I know it also um, is home to some March Madness games. Not sure what else is on True TV nowadays, but if you happen to find yourself on True TV at 10 o'clock p.m. on a Wednesday, you can catch some action between Sacramento State and San Jose State. You won't find me watching it because why am I? I may hate to say waste my time, but I will say, mo- and you, most of you probably agree, that there are better things to do on a Thursday night unless you live in San Jose, California, and you need something to do. In that case, have yourself an evening enjoying watching some Spartan football against whatever the heck Sacramento State is. They look like it could be, just looking at their logo, they look like they could be some serpents or snakes or something. Let me see if I can, if I'm anywhere close to what that is. They're the Hornets, so I'm way off. Uh, (laughs) Very different than a serpent. So that'll do it for the Thursday matchups. When we talk again on Friday, we won't go through the entire week one weekend slate, I should say, because there's just way too many games. I'll highlight some of the best games. I'll share what I'm going to bet on for the weekend. I'll give you my picks for probably what I think each Big Ten team will do, especially in the more intriguing matchups. And uh, we'll talk more about all that stuff on Friday. And before we wrap up, before we wrap up today's show, I do want to get into one other thing I mentioned that I was going to talk about, and that is the early talks of UConn to potentially move to the Big 12. And it seems like a very odd move for them because UConn is in the rare position, honestly, very similar to Indiana to where basketball moves the needle for them more so than football does. They're an independent football team. They play basketball in the Big East, but as an FBS football program, they are one of the, heck, they may be the only remaining, outside of Notre Dame, they may be the only remaining independent team. But here's the thing. They've talked about potentially joining the Big 12 in all sports, Obviously, that includes football, and that would remove them from the Big East, and they would make this move in 2031. Well, hold on. There's So apparently it would be football in 2031, but they could potentially move earlier for all other sports before that. So that's a little confusing. I don't know if there's... So here we go. The addition would be for all sports and the delay to 2031 in football would give UConn a chance to catch up in terms of funding and a talent upgrade through NIL. That's odd. I mean, I get it. Yeah, UConn is definitely a step behind the rest of the college football world and they've been fairly irrelevant in FBS football for quite some time. But I don't really see the true benefit here. And maybe this that's just me being too narrow-minded with it, but UConn is clearly in a comfortable position in the Big East. I mean, they're, they, they're back-to-back national champions. And again, maybe they want to be a competitor in football, and maybe that's really what this is all, like the point of all of this, because as we mentioned before, there's a reason Indiana is now trying to take football a lot more seriously than they used to, because that is the engine that drives the train, that always will drive the train. Even if you do have a superior basketball program and that you do benefit from that, in this day and age where almost all of the money comes from football from the other programs, you want a piece of that pie. 
And if you get left behind, that's only going to diminish your football program or your basketball program that you love so much. And I'm sure UConn is along that those same lines of thinking. So we'll keep an eye on that as I guess that develops. But the delay to 2031 for football specifically. So when would they join in, in basketball? I'm trying to see that on here. I guess maybe that would be nearly immediately. So imagine if UConn moves to the Big 12 in all sports minus football, let's just say in 2026. That's over five years where you have Big East basketball and then Big 12 everything else, right? Am I, or no, excuse me, Big East, Big East everything else and then Big 12 football. Um, or I don't know, or it'd be independent. I don't know. I'm confusing myself even thinking about this. Um, maybe I'll try to figure out all the kinks of, and of how this works uh, before we chat again on Friday because this is a weird situation for uh, for the Huskies. But with that being said, thank you for joining me once again on a Wednesday. This has been another edition of In Touch with Indiana Sports. We'll be back again on Friday for one final look, one final preview, I should say, at the Indiana Hoosiers football team as they prepare for their home opener and kick off the Kurt Signetti era on Saturday against the Florida International Panthers. And I'm looking forward to getting things rolling with you guys again on Friday. Until next time, this has been another edition of In Touch with Indiana Sports, powered by NewsRealEllustrated.com.